We also have the pass light term, which represents a flash of light converging on that point. It's just a sort of useful thing to think about. Now, in special relativity, you have one of these light terms at every point, and this represents the uh, possible things that matter can do, is to find... So you have a world, a massive particle will be represented, its history will be represented by a world line, that's a curve in this four-dimensional space, with the space and time all together in it. This curve represents the history of that particle, and since it's not allowed to travel faster than light, according to Einstein, that means this curve must always be within the curves. So the lights, the particle symbols can't get out here, but the curves will fit inwards. That general relativity looks just like special relativity here, except that the cones are a little bit higgledy piggledy So the, that's what's happening in black hole. Light signals have histories or world lines which are along the light cones. And here we have two examples. So light signals are along the light cones like these here. The next time I'm going to look and try to look into the whole car, because the cones are all over. The other feature that's important in this picture is this beautiful thing in the middle, the singularity. This is where curvatures again become infinite, like the Big Bang, they blow up, and space and time come to an end in the middle. Uh, um, yeah. So that's, 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 it would be not unpleasant to fall into one of these things, but it would guide humans towards that singular central region. Now, what I wanted to say was that how do we characterize the very fundamental difference between the Big Bang and these singular things in black holes? They're both singularities, and in the old days when people started thinking about these things, if you were happy with one, they'd use the argument, well, the other is just the time of this, the one, so you have to be happy with the other. Because people are usually not happy with them, and it's more question of getting used to it. So here we have singularities at the beginning and locally at the end of local people who are fortunate enough to fall into the black holes. Uh, but there is a fundamental difference between past and future which is expressed in the second law of thermodynamics. You see the initial state is very uniform and that's how we manage to get our entropy increase by collapsing matter into clumps rather than being uniformly spread. And it's the potential for that which requires this uniform initial state. Yet the singularities of black holes are not of this character. They're just completely different. And if, well you see, what is it? How can you understand singularities? Well the official answer to that is quantum gravity. So they say quantum gravity, that's what you should be doing. But there's always one of the reasons for studying the subject. Uh, I remember trying to say that myself. Why do we want to quantize gravity? Because it will explain what these awful classical singularities are that come in Einstein's theory. Maybe we can get rid of them, maybe we can have a physics which we can understand. But what is quantum gravity? Is it the application of standard procedures of quantum theory or quantum field theory to general relativity, or perhaps some other gravitational theory if they have trouble with general relativity? Or is it some more even-handed marriage with gear on both sides, which would require not only space-time structure to become modified in accordance with quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics to become modified in accordance with the principles of general relativity. And I wouldn't be saying this if I was a strong proponent of the second point of view, whereas if you talk to almost anybody who purports to be somebody studying quantum gravity, there would be a proponent of the first point. So I'm saying something which is unconventional, but it seems to me to be uh, very naturally what's required. There's at least there's several reasons for this. Let me mention two of them. One of them is this. That we have this gross asymmetry in one place that we really do expect an equal gravity in an observational way, namely to understand these singularities. And they're completely different in past and future. Quantum mechanics, as understood today, doesn't have this asymmetry future in the past, nor does general relativity. 
that you're going to bring these together in a way which has this asymmetry. It looks as though you're going to have to modify quantum mechanics. The other reason I believe you have to modify quantum mechanics, or one of the others, is that quantum mechanics is not really a coherent whole as it exists. You have two procedures in quantum mechanics which are, strictly speaking, are not consistent with each other. I won't go into it. There's a thing called the measurement paradox. I guess some people here must have heard Tony Leggett's talk some weeks ago, in which he presented a no doubt, he must have done it. I wasn't here, but I know his point of view. He must have expressed the discomfiture that he would have had with the present day um, perspective of quantum mechanics and that something new needs to be done. So I do believe that, and I believe that one of the places to look for something new is in this quantum reality. Of course, the trouble is, if you're, I mean, it's enough trouble doing this because you've got to try and bring quantum mechanics into this very view, you know, it's a very di difficult to bring the two subjects together, general relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, you modify general relativity to make it consistent with quantum mechanics, but if you've got to change both of them, where do you stand? And this, I suppose, is the main reason why you don't find people actually trying the second alternative. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean it's not right, and I think it is right in my view. Okay, now I want to describe something which is referred to uh, which, well, I hope I can find it, here we are, that's right. Uh, well, you see, what, how do we understand this asymmetry? I've drawn a sort of cartoon here. <coughs> this is supposed to be the space time here. <coughs> These are the singularities and gravitational collapse in black holes. This is the big band I sort of stretched it out. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but the point is that the, there's a thing called the vial curvature, which seems to be very small, or perhaps zero, Big Bang and very big at the other end. Now, what is the vial curvature? Well, first of all, I sucked out some formulae. So I urge you, those of you who like formulae, to see the answer here. Um, if you want to know more about what these things represent, the vial curvature is this thing that's called C. It's called C because it's the formula. It's the analog in gravitational theory of the Maxwell tensor actual field tensor of electromagnetic theory. The source of the vial tensor is the Ricci tensor, roughly speaking, and this is the analog of the Maxwell charge current tensor. So if you know about Maxwell theory, this is what will tell you what these two things are. Otherwise, I can tell you what they are by using the geometrical picture here. Here we have Acceleration part. Here we have an astronaut surrounded by some particles. Initially, in a sphere at rest with respect to the astronaut, and then the astronaut lets go, and then you get distorted. The sphere gets distorted from the ellipsoid of initially the same volume as the sphere distorted. This is called the tidal distortion. Here we have this is the what's happening in vacuum, and this is the vial curvature that you're measuring. Here we have what happens in uh, if you're surrounding a body. Here we have all the particles surrounding the Earth, and the volume reduces. So it's the volume reduction, which is the Ritchie curvature, <coughs> the distortion, which is the vial curvature. I say it a different way. I'm going to say it three different, well, two different ways. Uh, three different ways, because it's this way, that way. And here's another way, which is sort of like what I just said. But uh, in the case of light rays, here we have the sun, the history of the sun, this is a tube in space-time. Here we have the bending of the light by the sun's gravitational field. Two distant stars, because they bend inwards, the image of these two different stars appear to be further out than they actually are, if you like, the sun right there. So there's a spreading out of the star field. This is what Edmonton observed first, just after the First World War, and provided an, an amazing confirmation of Einstein's theory. Here I've shown you the sort of thing that happens. Here we have the sun, and I'm pretending it's transparent. And uh, the sun acts as a lens, that's the Ritchie curvature, magnifying the background field. And here we have what happens to the outside part, that's the vial curvature, where you get a circular pattern that's been distorted into the ones. The vial curvature is seen outside here, it's the distortion, the Ritchie curvature inside, that's the magnification, and that's the space curvature. Okay, so I'm doing this rather quickly, but uh, I think what you might like to see is this. Here we have, see Einstein thought people would never see this effect happen.